And if he doesn't mind me saying, Farhan Lalji, I hope he doesn't mind me saying, he was supposed to be with us today, but he was unable to join us live. Uh, he is joining us virtually here. Uh, Farhan's here to cover the Super Bowl. Man, if you wouldn't mind, good day. Thanks for the time, Farhan. Uh, can you tell the folks how your Super Bowl week has gone? Well, it's not been ideal, my good friend. Uh, I flew in on Sunday night, uh, started experiencing a couple of flu-like symptoms, and in the morning, I tested positive on Monday for COVID. So uh, not ideal. So for the next five days, I'm going to be in my hotel room. Uh, you know, I don't have any symptoms now. I, you know, it, it, the aches or whatever dissipated right away. But uh, there's obviously protocols and policies, both corporately and, and government-wise. So for five days, I'm quarantining here in the hotel in Marina Del Rey. And as you can see, the view behind me, like, I, I can't even go poolside, my friend. I'm, I'm here in the room. This view is as good as it gets. So I, I apologize for not being completely well lit because the sun's behind me. But I just, I wanted to be outside to at least not give your viewers the feel that I was completely hauled up in a hotel room with just beds behind me. At least you have a balcony, and I, I appreciate it. Welcome to the yeah. old club, by the way, because I had the Omicron uh, as well. Unfortunately, got over it well ahead of Super Bowl. But listen, you're a veteran of many Super Bowls. The one I distinctly remember following your coverage was Tampa Bay, Arizona, Pittsburgh. But again, you're a veteran of a lot of these. This is my first. I'm a little overwhelmed already. And like Ryan Bold said, it, it's just getting started. It's insane, Farhan. Well, it is insane, but it's not nearly as insane as it's been in the past, right? And, you know, before COVID, when the teams were down here from really from Tuesday onwards, and in some cases Monday as well, you had the media night festivities and everything else that went with it. I mean, it's it's scaled back, right? I mean, last year I didn't get a chance to cover it because your travel was just at a standstill. And even in the stadium, there was only 25% uh, capacity or whatever the number was. So, um it's great that it's kind of slowly coming back. There is an event on Friday night that we're welcome to attend. I'm not sure if I'll take the chance to attend that yet, but um, yeah, it's it's good. There'll be a full crowd, and we're slowly coming out of this. But uh, Super Bowl is in the past. It it uh, it can turn into quite the quite the um, week long event. You know, there's the the Playboy party, the Maxim party, ESPN has a party. Everybody's got something. Everybody who is somebody has something. So next year, I am confident there will be a Rod Peterson party down at Super Bowl. Oh, yeah, DuPont, uh, I don't know if he's listening or not. He's already planning it. Yeah, you're right. I, I got Arizona will be the place that I just can't see us not going to this every year. But let me ask you this. Yeah. You're a football guy, football first, I believe. And I was just doing a little reading this morning, and I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, this is just a football game. Or is it just a football game? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's still going to come down to who wins the turnover battle, who makes the least amount of mistakes. Does that get lost at all? Well, it, it does, right? And I think you're right. It is a football game. But ultimately, you know, you're you're going to see who can create the thought that it's just a football game when the ball gets kicked off, right? Which quarterback can kind of stay in that moment, to coin a cliche, and which coach doesn't feel they need to do too much or, or just, you know, isn't up for the task, right? I mean, when you look at what happened four years ago when Sean McVay was in this game, he got completely outcoached by Bill Belichick. Now, that's not necessarily a crime, but... He just didn't stay within what he did throughout the course of the season, right? You just decisions that were made in those moments weren't there. And, you know, in some cases, he just got really, really conservative. Part of that was the fact that he had Jared Goff at quarterback. But the other part was I think he was a little bit afraid of the moment. And he talked about learning a lot since that time. Zach Taylor is going to have to go through that now. I don't think the moment is going to phase a guy like Joe Burrow, right? Just the way he has performed and, and carried himself all year is Joe Cool. I don't think the moment's going to get too big for him. I saw what he did in the national championship firsthand two years ago when he played for LSU. Whereas you get a guy like Matt Stafford, you know, he hasn't necessarily had these moments during his NFL time, right? I mean, he, you know, played in state title games in high school at Texas Stadium and big games in Georgia. But when you're in Detroit, you don't have that. And now you're 34 and you finally get to be here. Do you try to do too much? Because you're finally getting this moment, right? So there's all of those variables um, to, you know, if you can find a way to pretend that this is just another football game or treat it like it's just another football game, you've got more chance to succeed. For sure. I mean, I know that it's not just another game. It's the breaks, the commercial breaks are four minutes as opposed to 90 seconds, half times a half an hour versus 16. Sure. And I could tell stories from Grey Cups past. I just remember Ken Austin all year long, Farhan, in 2007, like at the week one, Labor Day playoff, I kept saying, is this a special moment? He's like, Rod, it's just a game. It's just a game. Blah, blah, blah. We get to the Grey Cup in Toronto, Skydome. 
you're probably there. And I'm interviewing Ken for the pregame. Let me guess, Ken, did, Ken, it's just a game, right? And he's like, no, Rod, it's a championship. We count these things. You know what I mean? So it is a little different. <laughs> that's Kent for you. The, uh, the CFL fans, by the way, are all over me. They want your comments on CFL free agency. By the way, Arlen Bruce III is watching and says, Farhan could definitely be a CFL head coach or CFL general manager. Facts. Great guy. That's from Farhan. I thought I would just pass that along. Arlen or, is uh, from great Arlen. Guy. Yeah. Thank you, Arlen. Patrolman Pete's. He's in Winnipeg. Patrolman Pete says, Farhan, congratulations on breaking the news about Andrew Harris. It sounds like there was friction between the Bombers and Harris, which may have scuttled a deal. Do you know what came about between the two sides? Yeah, you know, I think there was a level of friction, and I think it started last year, right? I mean, when uh, you had a number of veteran players that didn't necessarily prepare the same way for the year, Andrew was one of them, who's notoriously... You know, it, it takes him a while to kind of get in shape during most seasons. And, and he was admittedly distracted going into last year. A lot of things going on in his personal life. And, and that carried over into the regular season. And that led to some of his injuries, at least as far as the team believes. And I mean, I don't think he would dispute that as far as the first injury is concerned. So I think there was a bit of lingering frustration that came from that. And now if you're Mike O'Shea, you got this running back who, yes, he's an icon in Winnipeg, but you know, he's going to be 35 next season, and you've got two young guys waiting in the wings. And how do you know that, that Andrew's going to be the guy you need him to be for 18 games? And, you know, at one point they actually asked Andrew to go work out for them, right? And, and I think he got a little insulted. And, and just generally there was that friction between the club. He felt that he had done a lot for this club, and I think he felt a level of disrespect. And um, I think a lot of people feel this whole thing could have been handled differently, but ultimately – uh, this is a good thing for Andrew Harris. You know, the downside is he doesn't get to play in, in his hometown and he doesn't get to play in front of that offensive line that's just the best in the league by far. But I watched Andrew Harris go through this in 2015. I mean, if you had seen him play, and you did, you, you watched him play in 2015 in BC behind an average offensive line and maybe wasn't as motivated and he was not good and he was just emotionally not good and it was not good for the team. And then all of a sudden he gets a chance to go to Winnipeg and he feels like he's this guy that has a chip on his shoulder and something to prove. That's the best of Andrew Harris. So Andrew Harris has actually been training for the last few weeks. Usually he doesn't get started until March. Um, he is hungry. He is motivated. And if he needs that level of motivation to show what he can do for one more year, even if it is his last year, it's probably a good thing for him. You know, some, some have said to me, this is, you know, they've given Andrew Harris a gift and um, they probably have on some levels. He seems like a really great guy, and he's obviously a surefire Hall of Famer. I'm not sure I've met him personally, but I've sure loved watching him play. Janice in Edmonton, yeah. she's a Stamps fan, says, question for Farhan, where does he think Banks will end up, or will he retire? I, I noticed that he, we didn't see his name on day one of free agency landing anywhere. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's the thing, right, is that Banks talked about not playing a year ago. Now, many players felt that way, right, that they weren't going to play during COVID, but um, with with all those restrictions. But, you know, he kind of made it sound like uh, he was, at that moment, you know, considering retirement. But when you saw the statement and things that he made when the, when he decided to part ways and the Ticats decided to part ways with him, you certainly get the impression that he wants to play again, even though he's going to be 34. Um, and, and teams are going to try to find a way to get him at a discount, right? I mean, I think that Brandon Banks still has value in the league, but he's not a number one anymore. Probably not a number two in most situations, right? So. Does he go in as a number three? What does he get paid as a number three? If you're Brandon Banks and you think that Kenny Lawler and has reset the receiver market, no, no. He set the high end of the receiver market. I don't think he's reset day two of the receiver market. So whether you're Banks or even a guy like B.J. Cunningham, you know, teams are going to find value for you, but you're not going to get big money to play. So he's got to decide, do I want to play for 105 or 110000 Because that's probably what the market is going to – dictate that he winds up getting at this point. So I think Calgary's a good potential landing spot for a guy like Brandon Banks. I think um, I think there's still room in Ottawa to add one more playmaker at a low number. BC added Daniel Peterman, but I, I think BC would probably like an experienced depth receiver that, you know, you could say, look, you're going to be our scratch in most games. You'll get paid full salary. But if anything happens to Whitehead Burnham, or, you know, Katoy or Rhymes, we're going to find a way to put you into the lineup. I think there's a lot of teams looking for that. And whether you're uh, Cunningham or Banks or Ricky Collins, um, you know, I, I think there's some of those guys that are going to fit that bill, and whether or not they want to come into that role, that's something they're going to have to decide. 
I, I have to ask you your take on the one-year contracts because I've been on record for a couple of years now saying I don't like them. It was a concession the owners made for the players because the players want them. I don't think it's good for the CFL. I don't like this merry-go-round one year with a team type deal but that's just me some people said it creates parity and you can do a very quick rebuild with this where are you on the one-year contracts in the cfl yeah you know i I don't like it right i I do think a certain level of continuity is is good for the league now a couple of things there was a ton of interest yesterday rod and there's been a ton of interest for the last week or so about what was going to happen and there is some buzz that gets created by that level of movement so but at the same time i you know i do get what people are saying and really, this is going to come down to the owners. The owners need to give. The league needs to give. And, and by that, I mean, you have to guarantee a certain portion of year two and three in a contract if you want this to get fixed. The owners want their cake, and they want to eat it too. And, you know, I get that. But why would you do it if you're a player? Like, you're not morally obligated to do this. If the owners are just wanting to go back to the way it was, that that's what's good for the league. The owners have to give in a percentage of second and third years on a contract. Maybe it's um, you know 30% of the second year salary and 10 or 10 to 15% of the third year salary so that you've got to buy the guy out if you want to completely move on from the deal, right? At least this way you could say, okay, we could renegotiate and that 30% or 15% is built into that deal. They've got to do that because otherwise what incentive do the players have, right? And here's the other thing. Really look at it and find out how many key players are moved, okay? Andrew Harris moved. And that was that the result of a one-year contract? Is that was that the result of a team deciding to move on from an older player? Like generally, the best players get kept. You know, Duke Williams eventually got kept for Saskatchewan, right? They were able to add a few pieces. Most of the best players around the league, the players teams really want. You know, you'll get to a point at the end of Grey Cup where there's a huge list where three quarters of your team's a free agent. But GMs chip away at it. They chip away at it. They chip away at it. And by the time we get to February 7th or 8th or whatever the magic day is, most of the guys they truly want and the fans truly identify with get kept. So look at it from that perspective. It's not just as simple as saying the entire league is turning over because they're not. We've got 60 seconds. I think we have questions from fans from every CFL team, but I'll just leave it with the Lions and nice Lions colors, by the way, Farhan. They want to know what you think about the Canadian quarterback. No, no, this is salmon. This is salmon. It's not orange. It's just bad lighting. Okay, right, sure. Nathan Rourke and Michael O'Connor. Uh, what are they What are they doing out there? Are they going to go with Canadian quarterbacks to start? Yeah, that's the plan, right? They can get the ratio that way. They can control their cost that way. I think Nathan Rourke is going to be a great quarterback in this league. They have faith in him. And, yeah, it's easy to say he barely had any game experience, but understand that for more than half the year, he got every first-team rep in practice because of Riley's elbow, and they thought that Rourke may have to play. So they loved what he did in those settings. Uh, they you know, loved his preparation level and his professionalism. This guy's a big-time kid, um, and I think he's going to be very good in this league, and it's great that he's actually getting a legitimate opportunity here. I do get nervous the fact that they've got no safety net. They are jumping out of a plane without a parachute here. I think Michael O'Connor will be good, but it is a tough situation to have a kid backed up by a kid and have that little quarterbacking experience in the room. Ultimately, Trevor Harris wasn't comfortable with the role uh, that they were looking at with him when they were talking about him as the backup, so they gave it to O'Connor. So, again, big on Rourke, concerned about the situation, but I get why they're doing it. Farhan, I appreciate the time. I will tell you that I enjoy every time you come on the television. I enjoy what you have to say. I appreciate the time here today, and uh, get well soon, my man. Hope to see you by the end of the week. Thanks, pal. Sorry we couldn't do it in person, but next time. You bet. TSN's Farhan Lelji joining us from Marina Del Rey. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching the RP Show on YouTube. And don't forget, we're live daily on YouTube from noon to 2 Eastern. If you like what you see... Hit subscribe, and if you like the program, check around for other segments of The Rod Peterson Show here on YouTube.